Hey, this week we cover the SSH back door. It's a big deal. We cover the alternative to Broadcom's VMware. We talk about Intel finally moving away from Family 6. We talk about x86-64 versioning. There's a Blender release. There's a Flatpak release. There's a lot. You don't want to miss it, so stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is the Untitled Linux Show, episode 145, recorded March 30th. The Linux Hotline. Hey, howdy, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time it is. It's... Uh, it's the Untitled Linux Show. Boy, I do enough podcasts and recordings now, I had to stop and think about it. It's the Untitled Linux Show today because it's Saturday. That's the show where we get together and we geek out about Linux and open source and all sorts of fun things. It is, of course, not just me. I've got the entire gang with me today. The panel of experts and almost experts and Rob. And <laughs> <laughs> Somehow Rob is just the one that's easiest to pick on. I'm not sure why. I don't know what it is about Rob. He just has a very... It's just that sort of personality, something about him. <laughs> it's that little brother love. On. Yeah, that's what it is. He's got he's got little brother energy. Um, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna let Rob go first, um, and he is going to talk about yet another operating system, one that I have never heard of, and I'm looking forward to learning about it. Rob, what is FlyOS or is that FlyOS? I don't know. I'm, I've been calling it FlyOS, um, but. No, this 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 isn't another distro hop segment like, uh, you know, like uh, you might have come to expect for me, but it is something that just caught my eye this week. And although I haven't had a chance to uh, try it out, I wanted to bring it to everyone's attention. And, you know, maybe it's something some of you might be interested in to try out. Uh, so fly OS is your next ASL or Android subsystem for Linux. <laughs> <laughs> so Android subsystem that it's, it's a Android subsystem that allows you to easily and directly install Linux on Android, which includes a manager desktop software, wine and a web management dashboard. So, you know, you might be saying, what about Termux? Uh, so, Unlike Termux or Linux Deploy, which use clean Linux distributions, FlyOS includes a web remote management panel, which allows you to access your FlyOS directly using a browser. And every time I come to that now, I've been called it FlyOS, and now I, I, I keep thinking FlyOS. But uh, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> I'm going to say I'll try to stick with FlyOS. So so this distribution, it, it's based on Ubuntu, but they are planning to develop uh, container features so you can easily deploy other distributions in the future. And I'm just going to flip to their page for those who are watching. And you, know, you can, for those watching, you can see behind me, you got the, the web panel, the fly off system shows the memory, SSH running statuses. Uh, and okay, I wasn't scrolling for a second there for me for some reason. Um, <laughs> uh, and then you got, you have actually running Linux or accessing it in the web browser there. You have uh, Wine and then you know, other aspects of it. So this is kind of like, a, I don't know, like like Termux, but uh, more. You can run, the, run, run Linux on there and have your own... Uh, yeah, so one of the one of the neat things about Termux is that you install it as an application. You don't need to be root. Um, with with FlyOS, uh, it, it requires root, doesn't it? Yeah, you do have to uh, root your your Android device for it. Yeah, and so you know your your options there are kind of limited. You can either, if you have a uh, a sort of a jailbreak, a way to jailbreak it, you can root it without doing the re the reinstall. But on, usually on Android devices, if you go to root, the way that that works is you go and you unlock your bootloader. Part of unlocking your bootloader is it totally deletes your device for security reasons. I mean, like that makes sense from a security standpoint. It's kind of a pain for the end user, but I, I totally understand why that is a, a security decision that they've made. So you know when we when we compare it with Termux, I'm sure FlyOS can do a lot of cool things that Termux can't. 
Um, but it's it's kind of neat to keep in mind that Termux has that that big advantage that it is a uh, it's not necessarily requiring root. Yeah, that's one reason why I haven't gotten around to trying it yet. But it's a little more work. All right, so there is a security story, unfortunately, that we have to cover, and it is a doozy. Maybe the biggest security story I've ever covered. Maybe the maybe the biggest open source story we've seen in like a decade is is bad. And the the headline is SSH has a backdoor. And normally we would say that would be the punchline and it would be mostly a joke. And we would say but you know, it's actually not. And and here's what we're talking about. Well, it, unfortunately, in this case, there really is a backdoor and it really does impact SSH. Um, there is some good news, and that is it got caught before it got shipped in very many systems. Um, so let's just let's dive into this. So the 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 package in question is XZ, which is a file compression library. And specifically, it is the LZMA lib um, or lib LZMA. And about two years ago, um, to the, the, I, I will say the developer, the maintainer of that package is a man by the name of, uh, Lasse Colin, and he runs Tucani.org, uh, a, a good developer. Like this is not his fault. Um, he kind of had this habit that he would just sort of disappear from the internet for a week or two at a time, which again, that's fine. Everybody needs a break. He got approached a couple of years ago by another developer who was going by the name Gia Tan, J-I-A-T-A-N, who said, hey, let me come along and help co-maintain the XZ project. That's great. Co-maintainers are great. Um, the problem is, and of course, we see all this in retrospect. The problem is that when Gia Tan started doing this, um, one of the first things that he did is went to the, the Google... Um, OSS, uh, OSS dash fuzz project and said, Hey, by the way, we're about to introduce a change into XZ and your security fuzzing suite thinks that it's something malicious, but it's not just trust us. So here's this flag that makes it shut up. And the, the maintainer over there of that project said, okay, fine. It looks good to me. And he has since come back and said, in retrospect, this does not look good. And they of course reverted it. So why did, what, what does XZ have to do with SSH? Well, let's, let's dive into that first. So SSHD does not include XZ as one of its dependencies. That library does not get called. On several distros, Debian being one of them, I believe Fedora as well, SSHD is patched to depend upon system D. Makes sense. You want to be able to log your SSD, SSHD attempts. You want to be able to control SSHD. It's fine. System D depends upon lib LZMA, which is part of the XZ utils package, which is part of XZ. So in version 5.6.0 from February of this year, there is a what is labeled to be a test file. And so a lot of a lot of uh, libraries will include um, binary files. In this case, it claims to be, and it probably is, a um, an XZ compressed file. And the idea being, we have a test suite. As part of our test suite, we want to be able to try to uncompress this known file and see if it, you know, if it fails or if it passes. So nobody thought too much about that. Um, the problem is in 5.6.0 and 5.6.1, the last two releases of XZ, the release tarball does not actually match what is in the GitHub repo. There is one line that is added, and it is an M4 macro, which is part of the GNU Auto Tools system. And what it essentially does is it pulls in a bunch of code from this test file that got added to the repo. Well, that essentially means that you would look at the GitHub repo and it would look entirely benign. But then when all the distros pulled this tarball, which was signed by this developer, the developer that was considered to be one of the co-maintainers, 
it had a bunch of extra code in it. And what this code does is it looks and it sees, you know, so it's getting called as a library. It then looks and sees, okay, what is the name of the executable that is being called that is then loading this library? And if the executable name is SSHD, then it runs some code. And essentially what it does is it patches the SSHD program. And specifically, it patches an RSA uh, function. The RSA um, RSA decode something or other. Uh, and that function is part of verifying a public key. So you can, when you go to SSH into something, you can do it with a password, username or password, or you can use your public private key encryption. And so what we have here is some malware that is getting injected into verifying an incoming public key. Now, some of this has not entirely been deobfuscated. So like we don't know exactly for sure what it's doing. It's pretty obvious though that what what it's happening here is it's going to look for a like a pre-programmed public key and give SSH access. And so you have to imagine if this was not caught then you know it would have taken several years down the, the the line then your latest ubuntu server and your fedora will eventually become red hat which then becomes rocky linux and all linux and all those you would eventually get to the point to where they all have this cooked binary and then if someone wanted to they could just sshn as root and here i've got this magic private key that matches the public key inside of this and it would assumably let them in it is literally an ssh backdoor and we collectively got about this close to shipping it in a whole bunch of distros um the reason that it was caught was because and i believe he is actually a Microsoft, it's uh, and Andres Frund. I believe he's actually a Microsoft guy. I don't know that for a hundred percent, but he was looking at his system, like he was he was working with a bleeding edge system, and asked himself, "Why is SSH taking so long? Why is SSH pinning my CPU to a hundred percent when someone tries to log in?" And then he goes, "Oh, by the way, why was Valgrind having problems on this?" It's just something doesn't add up. So he started looking into it and realized that what was in the tarball does not match. Now, um, pretty much all the different distros have, have reacted to this. They've all pulled the versions. Um, the United States uh, CISA, the with cybersecurity Alliance or whatever that stands for uh, is involved now. Um, thankfully, uh, Lassa Colin has shown back up. Uh, he he is safe. This is actually something I was slightly worried about. He seems to be OK and uh, back back in uh, back in the saddle. Um, the the person previously known as as uh, as Jin um, Gia, Gia Tan, I am pretty well convinced that this is not a real person and is probably the. Uh, an employee of special services somewhere, whether that's China or North Korea, or he may be working for the NSA. I mean, honestly, who knows? I don't know that we're going to ever know that for sure. Um, but enough of this was done well enough that it seems that it is probably state sponsored activity. Uh, so some government somewhere tried to backdoor SSH, which is remarkable um and i've seen two different takes on this well more more than two but broadly speaking two different takes on this one being our systems work we found it and the other being we found it this time how many others are there or will there be and that's the one that we just don't know for sure um so like i say this is it's a huge deal maybe uh, maybe the biggest story I think it's probably the biggest story that we've ever covered. And uh, it's a, it's a really big deal. Um, I, I know at least a couple of you guys were following this. Have any thoughts on it? Well, I think even some of the cutting edge distributions like OpenSUSE Tumble, we did have it, the uh, vulnerable package 
uh, out there in the wild for a couple weeks. Yeah. I believe from March 7th to the 28th, I think I saw somewhere. Yeah. But so thankfully, nothing that a sane person is going to deploy public facing (laughs) as a production server. Yeah, not going to be a production server, but I mean, there could be there could be something else out there. I don't know. But yeah, yeah, I, I know I've seen a lot of them posting the last well, since yesterday, I guess, saying that they've rolled it back. I know I've seen posts from OpenSUSE, Solus, at least were a couple that yeah. I've seen. Yep. And I um, think anything exposed to be pretty corner case. Y- yes. At this point, if if this yeah. had gone on for a year, we would be in a very different situation. If it had gone on for six months, that would have been bad enough. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's been uh, it's been since February that it came out. So it's it's been about a month i suppose so well if you we're also coming around the time where a lot of distributions release their uh you know their next big release and lts for some of them and so this is this is one of the things that leads people to believe that it was not a developer with a compromised account it was actually a developer that had bad intentions from the very beginning um and that is uh the, the person claiming to be Giotan has over the past few weeks gone to various distros like Fedora and some others and said, hey, the new 5.6 series of XZ is really great. You guys really ought to try to get it into your distro. And uh, Fedora has like reported that. I believe Ubuntu with the next LTS. I think he was trying to get it pushed in there as well. Um yeah. yeah, trying to get that pushed out there to those uh, LTSs. And sure, LTSs continue to get updates. And most reasonable, good system administrators would update once that patch comes out. But you're going to have some out there lingering that they just install and they forget about it. And there's running old whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So anybody... If you have done updates in the past couple of months, I would say go look for XZ and make sure you're not running 560 or 561. Um, there's also an open question of, well, first off, is this just SSH? Could it be that this is malicious towards some other process? Um, and then there were patches added to XZ and other programs. I, I want to say that GitHub developer had something like 560 commits over the past couple of years. And we are now at the point to where all of those need to be looked at and maybe all of them reverted because it's just a, it's a it's a known it's a it, it is someone that is now known to be malicious. Um it's also scary to think that there is some XZ code in the Linux kernel. And I, I don't think that this developer was behind any of that, but I know there is at least one thread in the kernel where people are saying, do not pull this. In fact, if you have pulled it, go ahead and revert it. And we need to kind of do a security audit on all this stuff. So it's a it's it's a mess. And I, mess. I take the optimistic side and say, because it's open source, we caught it. Yes. If this had been in something proprietary, a random developer from another company would have had no chance of finding it. Um, It would have. It could have gone unnoticed for years. Um, Well, I I wonder how long before we start, you know, and I really hate to say this, you know, it's such a buzzword now, but how long before we can get AI tools that can just start going through the code looking for malicious things well i mean we have we we already have tooling and some of it is ai that looks for problems but some you you get you get false positives but even at that you have to have someone that knows what they're looking at so there was a um this has been several years ago probably a decade back uh one of the ssl libraries had um it had a feature where to get extra randomness to initialize everything for its initialization vectors, it would actually just read from uninitialized memory. And one of the maintainers at one of the big distros, it may have been Debian, I don't remember for sure, 
ran a one of these tools. I think it was Valgrind against it. And Valgrind said, hey, we're accessing uninitialized memory help. And so the developer went, oh, well, that's not right. And just commented it all out. Well, it turns out that when you do that, you you take your your entropy that you're supposed to start with and you you can now have this much entropy. And there was like a, a ridiculously small number of possible starting states like like it was scary small, like a 1024 possible starting states without that code that got removed. And so, you know, you, you do have these situations where if you go to run those tools and you don't actually know what you're doing, you can make things much worse. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it it is a it is a problem, um, and this is not the only open source security problem. Like you've got the typo squatting that's going on on PyPy and npm, um, and several several other things like that. That you know we are like actively trying to figure out how do we as the open source community deal with this. Um, I've seen some suggestions around this problem in particular, and I think one of the things that uh, distros are going to start doing is requiring that instead of getting a tarball that has been uploaded by a developer, it must be a tarball that has been automatically produced by, in this case, by GitHub. And there is there is a way to determine which you're looking at. Essentially, essentially you just tell GitHub, hey, I want this tarball that is based on this git commit. And uh, because of that, you have a little, you have a lot more reliability that you are, you do get the code that you think you're going to get. All right, we can move on and let's see. Uh, I, I don't have my notes back up yet. So either Ken or uh, Jeff, whichever it one is, of you is up. It is me. Jeff. And we're going to talk let's about to hardware. Some hardware. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, back back in my uh, warm <laughs> fuzzy place here. So I'm talking today about Intel Family Six CPU era coming to an end. Now, some people might be wondering, hey, which CPUs are not going to be in the Linux kernel anymore? Well, while old CPUs lose support after many years, that's not the case here. The naming convention is changing. So back in the Pentium Pro days, the CPU ID was Family Six. Well, that's kept going until today they just rev the model number so for example today we have meteor lake and that's family six model 170 so the naming is used by linux and other operating systems to know which cpu they have and how to deal with them because different cpus support different features and different instructions so the os needs to know what to run and what not to run now amd does things a little different they change their family through the different generation of chips. So for example, Zen 1, Zen 2 is family 23, Zen 3 and 4 being family 25, and now we have Zen 5 being family 26. So Intel is going to stop using family 6 for everything. Well, what does that mean? Intel's put out 74, 74 patches to adjust how Linux will handle the CPU identification in the future. They're gonna enable be able to handle non-zero values for the extended family field. Now they do have some examples what the future families might look like. And, you know, there is some spe speculation that these are real chips coming, or maybe they're just placeholders. I would take them as placeholders for now, you know, because, you know, they, they, uh, they haven't officially announced it and, you know, yeah, it sounds like real names, but even if it is, it really doesn't tell us much of anything. And you know, like I said, we, we always know Intel and all semiconductor companies have a large pipeline of chips that uh, like they always have for the last few decades. So there's always stuff coming down the pipe. Uh, change is going to happen, quote, soonish. <laughs> so we know Clearwater Forest, which is coming, will be Family 6 Model 221 and Lunar Lake will be Family 6 Model 189. So the family six is still going to be around at least for a bit. A suggested time frame uh, has is going to be around 2026, 2027 when we actually have this come into play with the different family numbers. Uh, this this has not hit the Linux kernel yet and is still being worked on, and they're still ironing out bugs and smoothing things out. And you know it's it's going to be a bit of time before it even hits an official pull request. 
Uh, the thinking on this is it will support much larger changes like the coming x86s mm. family of chips where intel has published a specification where the 16-bit and 32-bit os support is going away and only 64-bit will be supported or possibly intel fred which stands for flexible return and event delivery which is basically a new faster way of handling transitions between privilege levels in the cpu some people call these CPU rings. So you have different security rings in the processor based on what you're doing. So the new family designations could be for large fundamental changes coming in the operations of the CPU. So I think there's going to be some interesting changes in the future to look at. And I look forward to the new silicon coming down the pipe. Yeah. Interesting that that's, it, Intel has been on family six for this long now. Um, that's uh <laughs> that's something that is kind of an intel thing though uh they're, they're almost as bad as microsoft for keeping around old stuff that must work for whatever reason i mean you had mac os was on 10 for how many years <laughs> yeah i suppose yeah and, and it really if you look at a lot of the x86 chips there's not that much difference between a lot of the you know when you look P pentium pro to now mm -hmm there isn't a tremendous architecture change. I mean, they, yeah, they add some features and commands and whatnot, but it's still not a completely different architecture. Oh, indeed. I mean, you can still, you can still run 16 bit code. That's, that's right before Penny and bro. Goodness. So and you're that, still susceptible to the Spectre meltdown. Um, sure. <laughs> um, a lot of them are. Yeah. Uh, but, but see, that's where, too, they're get, talking about getting rid of hyper-threading in some future silicon. So that would eliminate some of that speculation because there's nothing to speculate when you're just running straight through the pipe and you're not trying to predict branches or well things I, like that. I don't think getting rid of hyper-threading is going to get rid of prediction. It'll make some of those a little more difficult to pull off because you can't, you can't have two threads on the same CPU quite in the same way. Um, but no, it, getting rid of the hyper thread is not going to not going to be the silver bullet that solves the the speculative execution problem. Um, if you were to completely get rid of look ahead, uh, as far as trying to speed things up, our, our computers, um, what are they called? IPC instructions per clock would just plummet. Uh, everything would get much slower without it. Um, you may have seen the quote unquote unpatchable uh, uh, Mac bug on the m1 the m2 in the past week in fact a notorious troll online called it a back door well that's not accurate but it is it is yet another it's not exactly speculative execution um but what that is is it's let's look ahead and try to load memory earlier and some of that memory it misunderstands as being pointers and so you can actually leak some information that way uh but without without all of those tricks, our our CPUs would be slow. Like that's one of the, that's one of the things that makes the M1 and the M2 so impressively fast. I get the feeling we've got a Douglas, Douglas Adams fan that's uh, naming some of these. <laughs> Maybe the the uh... Douglas Cove and Adams Lake. <laughs> uh, there's it actually. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying, but, you know, actually, there is a decoder for the, the like, and I, I can't remember exactly what it is, but if it's like it's a lake, it's a certain type of CPU, and the enterprise CPUs have a different, you know, like it's a river or a bay or something, and then, you know, same way with the, so you, just hearing the code name, if you're in the know, you can you can just say oh i know that's a mobile processor that's a enterprise you know type uh processor mm -hmm. so there, there's rhyme or reason to their naming yes intel has fun with that naming system uh, and, uh let's and i can tell you a lot of companies have fun with that naming system oh yes and and this is something i could say having worked at a large semiconductor company we get some pretty funny names internally <laughs> too mm-hmm some of those are not for public consumption, but they're fun. <laughs> All right, Ken, let's yeah. talk Blender. Uh, all right, Jonathan, and we're hearing from Marius Nestor about Blender 4.1 being 
released by the Blender Foundation. It introduces quality of life improvements and performance enhancements all across the board to make Blender more useful and reliable, especially for modelers or animators. Highlights of Blender 4.1 include a new file handler API that lets devs extend traditional file import operators with drag and drop behavior throughout the Blender user interface, adding support for the Alembic, Colada, Grease Pencil SVG, OBJ or Object, uh, OpenUSD, PLY, and STL file formats within the 3D viewport and outliner areas. Also new is the GPU accelerated hardware support for open image denoise when using GPU rendering in the 3D viewport. This supports NVIDIA GTX 16XX series, NVIDIA Titan, I'm going to say 5 this time instead of V, <laughs> and all NVIDIA RTX GPUs, Intel GPUs with a XE-HPG architecture or newer, as well as Apple Silicon. Mm. For now, AMD GPUs are not supported due to stability issues. Sad trombone. Blend <laughs> Blender 4.1 adds a new soft fall-off option to point and spot lights to make the lights render the same as in Blender 3.6 LTS and earlier versions. The light texture radius acts as a blurring factor for the projected texture when the new soft fall off option is applied and it will be directly visible on the spherical light source when the new soft fall off option is not applied. This release makes bone collections hierarchical by showing them in a tree instead of a fat, flat list and allowing you to reorder them using drag and drop. In addition, double clicking an object or collection icon in the outliner will now select all of its children, which has been one of the most requested features by users. I know I'm looking forward to that one. Mm -hmm. Blender 4.1 also adds an option to create motion paths relative to the active camera, improves the speed of dope sheet by only calculating keyframes that are visible in the current view, and adds a new option in the graph editor to automatically lock key movement to either the X or Y axis. For more details about the new features, fixes, improvements, and other changes included in this release, check out Marius' article, which includes a link to the release notes. There's also an 11-minute video overview of the new features by CG Cookies' Jonathan Lampel. I am not entirely surprised, but I find it unfortunate that there is not... Uh... AMD GPU support at this point for, for that particular feature. <laughs> that is the sad, sad, but common truth. Um, I'm wondering what the stability issues are. I mean, that actually sounds kind of similar to what um, uh, GeoHot, George Hotz, was complaining about with uh, the, the tiny corp boxes. He was, he was saying that they may not be able to ship those with AMD GPU because but they of, changed their mind they've changed their mind about three times now last i heard <laughs> last i heard they are thinking that they're going to be able to ship them um but yeah it kind of highlights that amd still needs to do some work around getting compute uh ready to go it's not quite there yet well and don't don't take into uh, forget to take into account you know they said well okay we're gonna go back to amd because they might have went we're gonna have to pay how much and the lead time is what <laughs> For NVIDIA? <laughs> well, with, with Tiny Core, with those boxes, they're doing both. The plan is that they're going to they're gonna ship um, ship both options. And so th that's what they wanted to do from the beginning, but they were having such stability issues with AMD and did not think that they had the tools to actually be able to fix it. Um, and then they, finally, they got a hold of Lisa Sue herself, who said, we're going to look into this and try to help you. And, and so they're like, oh, we can do it. And then that apparently didn't pan out the way they wanted it to. So no, we can't do it. And then the next thing it's like, but we found a tool hidden on GitHub that we think will let us do it. So we're back to shipping them again. <laughs> quite the, uh, it was quite the affair. Uh, so, okay. Rob, why do we need a broad, Broadcom alternative? What are we, what are we alternating away from that is Broadcom? 
Because they break everything they buy. <laughs> so I see. <laughs> at, at, at least at a, I don't know, a partnership level. But yeah, I don't, I don't know that we've ever really talked about Broadcom much on, you know, this Linux show. But the story I have here today, Linux is able to save the day. <laughs> but before, before I get into that, I'm going to get up on my soapbox. I have I have my microphone here and I, 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 I could speak to this. And this is something every time I hear someone talk about, it's like, I just want to, you know, scream. So, you know, many of you may be aware that that the hardware manufacturer Broadcom has recently purchased VMware. And like like they seem to do often. Uh, when they purchase a software company, it looks like it looks like they're planning to ruin this purchase as well. <laughs> this isn't the first software company Broadcom has purchased and just gutted and did stupid stuff with. S- several years ago, Broadcom purchased Semantic, and in in my day job, uh, we were a Semantic reseller at the time. But after Broadcom purchased Semantic, they they broke their partner channels. Uh, we had clients that needed to renew and they just didn't have a way to do that. They just mm-hmm. like, yeah, we can't do it right now. This is figure it out, whatever, <laughs> figure it out, figure it out yourselves. <laughs> and then, and then, then they figured it out. And, and then after that, other multi-year licenses were ended, terminated before they were up. And I think they had some, some, th- some ways to keep going and make it right. But, you know, in short, we we were pretty much just forced to find alternatives. And all said, I'm really actually glad they forced us to make that change because there, there's just better alternatives anyway. But you know, now with their purchase of VMware, they're they're shaking things up and and upsetting a lot of people again. First, VMware, you know, they used to have their free ESXi version. Uh, many of you, if you're IT technical people, might be aware. I've I've played with that myself, but I haven't used it in years. But, you know, what this does is, you know, just having that out there, it allows hobbyists to learn and get familiar with the VMware vSphere ecosystem. And then later, you know, bring it to the companies that they work for, you know, because they know it, they like it. It's like, hey, let's buy this and spend thousands of dollars on this. You know, it allowed IT departments to to test it, trial it you know, before eventually going all in on the product. And, you know, but the part Broadcom probably likes the least and like it all is it, it also allowed the little guys to use their product for free. And I've seen competitors, you know, we always, where I, where I work, we try to do things on the up and up. But I've seen competitors actually basically sell the free one to their clients and stuff and install it. But, but anyway, there's way more benefit. I think to have on that there than not. Next thing they're changing is the perpetual license model and moving to a subscription, which everyone seems to be doing, Mm -hmm. but their transition, you know, it, they're just so bad at it. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's caused issues for us too. About a month or maybe it's two months ago, we were we were getting some quotes for a client of ours. You know, we're talking like close to a hundred thousand dollar server setups. Mm, sure. <laughs> but when it came to the VMware part, you know, we're talking to our, our OEM and they said, uh, Broadcom's making some changes since they purchased it. And right now we can't provide a quote to have that pre-installed um with with the server stuff. Oof. So you're gonna have to just get that directly from them for now. Um, maybe, maybe we'll see what happens here, maybe in the future. So I was like, oh, okay, sure, whatever. So once again, you know, in the process of change, Broadcom breaks their partner channels. Uh, you know, bite in the hand that feeds. These people are selling stuff for you there. You know, you got like free salespeople that, that you don't have to pay hourly when you only pay them when they sell for you. It's like, I don't understand why any company would, would not bend over backwards for their sales partner channels. But okay, off my soapbox. Now that I've got that out of the way, <laughs> uh, finally onto the story. Do I still have time? <laughs> sure. Um, 
So even though VMware is damaging their customer base and and you know migrations can sometimes be difficult, we are fortunate that Proxmox, an open source alternative to VMware, has introduced a new import wizard to make the migration easier. So the import wizard utilizes a storage plugin system for native integration into the API and web-based user interface. The wizard walks you through the migration, mapping VMware's configurations to, to Proxmox configurations, ensuring there's a reduced minimal downtime, and even providing the ability to use live import as well uh, to migrate even faster. I've, I, I think I talked about it on the show. I've been using Proxmox now only for well, several months now, but, uh, and the features seem very comparable, uh, to the VMware vSphere ESXi ecosystem. You know, even the enterprise features such as high availability and, and the ability to hot migrate and, and quickly move, uh, virtual machines in between, uh, hosts, hypervisor hosts. It, it works great. I tested it. I've, I've used it. I, I actually, I have two at home and I use mm -hmm. that fairly often. It, it works great. Uh, and, and, you know, for the enterprises who are using this kind of stuff, Proxmox even has paid support that many, you know, enterprises some, sometimes they have to require that kind of stuff for compliance, Yep. but it's a much lower price than, than VMware. So Oh, and one last great feature I, I, I like. It, it was kind of what really sold me to get to it before I even knew about this VMware stuff. And, and I don't use VMware at home anyway, but um, uh, if, if you're running Linux VMs, Proxmox has, you, you, can, you can opt, you can run these as containers instead, you know, under some, certain circumstances at least. So I guess what I'm saying is Proxmox can also do containers, not just virtual machines. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just not something VMware can do. So, you know, not only is Proxmox a great alternative to VMware, I'm starting to think it's becoming even a better alternative in at least in many, many aspects. And I, this, this might, this might be what a lot of businesses might be uh, getting in the future. I see. I see great a great future for Proxmox. Yeah, for sure. Um, I am I am humored that VMware survived all of its previous owners and its Broadcom that finally realized that it existed and is now trying to uh, let's see how do how do we say it here in certify the uh, <laughs> that's the <it>. product. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, fun. Oh, and by the way, Rob, we have all the time in the world. As much as you want to yell at clouds, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fun. It's cathartic. It is cathartic. So we are going to let Jeff go ahead and take his next story, which is uh, about something really interesting. I've been kind of following this idea for a while, and it's the x86-64 uh, version levels. And uh, yet another company is maybe jumping on board with going to x86-64 v3? Kind of. So there's going to be a little uh, background here for the people that don't remember or are new to the show. So the old pros that know about this, just hang in there. So we've talked in the past where Canonical made a release of Ubuntu, which was based on version 3 abilities. You know, short, like I said, short recap. CPUs are classified by what instructions they support. So in this case, V3, version three, it assumes AVX and AVX2 support. And for example, V4 assumes AVX512 support. So based on the version it, on, that the chip is, and it falls into what you compile your programs for, it tells you what advanced instructions a chip can support. So, this is this is coming out because V3 chips have been out for several years and the the V the version 2 chips are getting pretty old at this point so that's much much older and less instructions they support. Uh, Canonical is working to see if the changes in the version levels will make a large difference. So you know current Ubuntu versions are not changing so 2404 is still going to run on really old hardware it's coming out just the same as it always has. And 
you know, like we had a benchmarking of 2304, which they produced a while back and it was always experimental. It wasn't going to have all the security patches and, you know, but they, what they did is they compiled the operating system with these advanced features. Now this is the entire OS, all libraries, all other programs, everything is compiled with the version three options. So, you know, if you remember in the past, we would talk about, we would, we would compile a kernel. I mean, I've, I've done some benchmarking myself and didn't make a huge bit of difference, but certain pl places it did. Well, now it's the entire operating system. So there it's able to leverage those advanced instructions, even instructions, even more. And they set up their own repository. So if you install a program, it'll be pulled from those repositories and it would all have been built with version three options. So 100%. Now, and 2304 originally was very experimental and they said, don't use it for production. Don't use it for daily use. This is just a, hey, let's see what happens kind of uh, release. So we had bench parking on it. You know, our old friend over from Phronics, Michael Arable, he did benchmarking on it and he did it on a Xeon Platinum 8592 plus dual socket ML rapid server with one terabyte of RAM and a 960 got 60 gigabyte SSD. It's a Iron Eagle stream reference server is what it is. So, you know, when we looked at the results, there wasn't anything surprising. In general, the speed up was small, but there were certain small subsets of tests, which had rather large speed up. And, you know, a lot of like memory intensive, some graphics, other computational workloads did see a nice increase in speed. So, and, and again, this is not something that your home PC is going to see unless you're running something very specific. And even when I say computational and graphical computational, you know, for example, a lot of GIMP workloads didn't see really much of a change. You know, it was faster, but only the type that was going to show up in a benchmark type mm -hmm. of situation. Okay. All that being said, what's new? Well, now you can get 23.10 in version three images on Microsoft's Azure cloud. So you can try the distribution yourself and see what kind of speed ups you have in the, on your hardware and workloads. You know, Microsoft jumping with helping uh, canonical and, you know, what's the world coming to, you know, but <laughs> it's in there and I have a link to the article in the show notes and there's a link to the Ubuntu blog where they go into greater detail and kind of cover some of the stuff we, I just recapped here about, you know, better, faster kind of stuff. Um, and there is a link to the Ubuntu discourse in there where they give you instructions for those people wanting to experiment so you can actually play with it yourself. The other one was very, you had to be a, uh, Linux guru to be able to get it working. Cause they, they said in the original article that it was not something very easy and mm -hmm. th it was very, uh, developer heavy. And this one is they're trying to get out there for more average developers, more uh, advanced users to be able to use and try to run those experiments to see what kind of advantage they're going to have. Now, again, Canonical's not announced any changes for the regular version. So I don't even know if this will ever be. Well, I mean, eventually it's going to become reality just through the march of technology, but uh, there's nothing planned soon. So this is still very experimental. And maybe, maybe in a year, two years, we'll maybe see some kind of announcement, but nothing on the horizon right now. Uh, you know, but this, if this is any indication, you know, this is a larger testing pool. Now they're opening up to a lot more people and, you know, maybe this would become an official flavor beside the existing flavors we have. So you'd have a regular Ubuntu server, say, and then you'd have an Ubuntu server version three. So, and, and depending on how hard to compile and the automation would be, I mean, maybe we'd even see a version four, so you can really customize, uh, what operate or what distribution you have based on what hardware you have. So, you know, I'd be interested to hear from anyone testing this and, you know, if, if you have the right workloads or not, and see what you think of the speed increases, if you see them and, you know, let us know on our discord love love to hear any any uh 
feedback on this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the one that I find probably the most interesting is those couple of distributions where they're looking at shipping out the various version numbers side by side. And so when you go to install a package, RPM, I think RPM is the, the main packager that has the patch to do this. We'll look at your system and go, all right, what revision level of x86-64 are we at? Let's grab those packages. I think that's the one that's going to be the most interesting for a while. And then, like you say, of course, we'll eventually get to the time to where everything that is not x86-64 v3 is just so old. Who cares? We won't worry about packaging for it. But that's going to be a while because we still have some support for 32-bit stuff out there. So, Very true. And well, and it, it, well, you can still have 32-bit. It's just whether it supports the AV instruction set, AVX instruction mm -hmm. set. Well, yeah, so, but I'm, I mean, you've got you've got distros that are still shipping 32-bit support this long oh, after there is no more 32-bit hardware. And so, at what point is it going to be that your your x86-64 V2 is old enough that nobody cares about it anymore? Might it might be another decade? Right. It, well, and I was going to say we are currently on V2. I mean. Nobody's compiling for V1 anymore. Yeah, it's yeah. it's at very minimum V2. And Red Hat has talked about this as well a little bit. And mm -hmm. I know they've been playing a little bit. So right now, Canonical is kind of going after Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So if they switch, if Red Hat switches, I could see Canonical and I could see the other way around as well. I think they're, isn't, they're isn't, fighting some server space. Isn't the latest RHEL uh, V3 only? Uh, I think they talked about it, but I want to say they didn't do that unless I'm, I missed something. I'm maybe it's V2 only and I'm, my server is older than I think it is. I've got I've got a server actually out in the data center that will not run the latest rel because of because of one of these. Uh, I will have to look into that because I don't remember. Maybe it's maybe it's V2 and that old server is just not V2 yet. Um yeah, I like I said, I thought it was that they were still on V2 and they hadn't, but but they were seriously talking about converting, but they they hadn't yet on for fear of what hardware out there will get locked out. Is it eight where they went to V2? Oh, I V2, I don't know. I know it's been a while, but I I that one I do not know. I will have to look because I don't remember. Uh, I, but I, as I said, I know I've got a piece of hardware that is great in all other respects, but just because of where it, where it lands in the timeline, it uh, it will not play with the with the latest rel, which is really kind of a pain. Um, anyway, let's chat about Flatpak. Is Flatpak up next? Yes, John. In fact, Michael Larabelle reports on Simon McVitie releasing Flatpak 1.15.7 pre-release this week. This pre-release switches from Auto Tools to the Meson build. It also requires bubble wrap version 0 0.9.0 and xdg-dbus-proxy version 0 0.1.5. If lib malcontent, this is for parental controls people, is enabled, it must be version 0 0.5.0 or later. I look forward to Flatpak 1.15.7 automatically removing obsolete driver versions and other auto pruned refs when I update my Flatpaks. It also adds the dash dash socket equals inherit dash Wayland dash socket argument to inherit the existing Wayland socket environment and automatically reloads the dbus session bus configuration when installing or upgrading apps to ensure any exported dbus services are recognized. This update is rounded out by many bug fixes ranging from dbus and Wayland issues to fixing memory leaks, improving async, async signal safety, and documentation improvements. Anybody uh, try, trying out the pre-release yet? Not yet. I'm not that much. Well, I say that. I don't know what's running on the... Now, Fedora 41 raw high behind me because I accidentally didn't jump off the boat at the right time. Uh, who <laughs> knows? Maybe it is running that pre-release. 
Uh, Whatever's hey, on I, top I, of weed. Yeah, yeah. I say I, I warned you, Jonathan. You had we we had a story about it. you had to jump off at this I, certain time. I thought I did. <laughs> That's the thing. I thought I ran the magic commands and uninstalled some packages, but uh, not the right ones, I guess. <laughs> So now the last time I tried to do it, it's like doing this would uninstall your entire system. Cannot do that. It's like, oh, great. That's okay. I didn't jump off either. So yeah, I, well, that's actually, every time I go over, there's a lot of updates and that's my main machine I? though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, whoops. Yeah. My main machine's on tumbleweed. It's, I like it that way. Yeah. It's about the same. That's about the same. Oh, my, my main's on 2310 and it's probably going to go to 2404 and just sit there for a long time yep yeah probably oh okay so what is this about ext2 rob well what did you do Linux rob <laughs> <laughs> if any of you are still using ext2 the ext2 file system you're gonna need to find a replacement because, you know, that's a, a 30 year old file system. So you maybe should have been looking soon anyway to upgrade. But uh, as of Linux 6.9, uh, it, it, they're going to finally deprecate ext2. You know, I'm sure uh, I'm not sure what took them so long, you know, considering ext3 has been around for like 20 years and ext4 for several years itself. But you know, I guess if, you know, maybe if you're maintaining some old long running systems like that, that one, that server you have in the data center, Jonathan, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, upgrading a file system is maybe the last thing you want to do. You kind of don't want to mess with files <laughs> yeah. unless, but I mean, you always have good backups too. So, eh, you know, keep things up to date, but you know. Uh, you know, besides that, you know, a funny story is some people are are still installing ext2 today. And I say that because I recently came across a post on social media where someone was looking for partitioning recommendations. They're, they're sending something I'm like, hey, how do you guys think I should partition my, 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 my drive, my storage? And the response from one of the people was he said, I may be getting these two backwards, but I definitely know the ext2. I think he said ButterFS or BTRFS for slash or the root, uh, ext4 for home. And then he said ext2 for slash boot. <laughs> um, like I said, I could be right. I, but I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure there's no reason to use ext2 like this and, and when the guy was asked somebody else asked the guy in there why why are you using exe2 and his response was he didn't really know he just thought he read it somewhere that <laughs> there's some benefit to use an exe2 on slash boot um i'm sure but, once upon a time that was all <laughs> grub supported yeah yeah like 20 years ago but, yeah <laughs> but you know like i said unless unless Besides that, you know, 10, 20 year ago, a thing where that's what you needed for Grub to work because it wasn't ready for HD3 yet. Um, I'm 99% sure there is no benefit. But even besides that fact, uh, that is that's now deprecated. But there's or even besides the fact that it's now deprecated, there is one more uh, reason. And there's a date, a not so distant date. Uh, in the future that makes for a good reason to stop using ext2 eh, eventually i mean why you use it 20 2024 okay we're talking 14 years still but 14 <laughs> years is going to come up on this fast <laughs> yeah and anyway for those who still don't know what i'm talking about that is that the ext2 file system driver doesn't support dates past january 19 2038 and this is known as the famous Y2038 problem. I, I'm sure we've had to have mentioned it on the show, mm -hmm. um, but not a whole lot. The, 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 Y20, the Y2038 problem, I'll, I'll let you expand on that after I'm done here if you want. But, uh, you know, if you're still using it, it's, it's time to modernize and upgrade away from ext2. And, and if you're still running some old systems on ext2, well, you know, that's might be some pretty old hardware, Jonathan, and maybe it's time to, to upgrade. 
<laughs> maybe or you know maybe you could upgrade to a nice new proxmox server and then it doesn't matter what's on the hardware it's virtualized well see that's the thing i've virtualized and it matters because if your uh bare if your bare bones won't support x86 64 v2 then you can't run a virtual machine that does without some real crazy hacks to make that work right right but what i'm saying is you get a nice new server that oh, supports yeah. the whatever and then you can migrate those old ones with the old whatever and then slowly upgrade them i don't know i suppose just I find <laughs> just find two or three customers that'll pay for it yeah yeah good luck <laughs> finding that um i i wonder if a lot of this would be coming from raids so if you had a raid that you had a long time ago and set up and just kept growing and throwing drives in and because it would because you would copy that first file system to the next drive and you just keep kind of keep going if it matched all the time i could see you could maybe carry over that ext2 for a long time don't right. do that it's not there don't do that it's not by the, the way <laughs> <laughs> raids Ooh. do degrade uh well, right, but it's not even necessarily the the original hard drive. Yeah, it just you 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 keep throwing different drives in as like a as a drive fails, you throw a new drive in, and is over the time you've had this same RAID for a long time, but it's not the original hardware it started with, but it's still that original image, and it's and you can grow RAIDs, so it's maybe okay. way bigger than it used to be, but it would still have that same file system as the very original. I wonder if that was an actual use case other than someone saying, well, I thought EXT2 would be great to have on here. If if a modern system that's like, why are you still running EXT2? Well, maybe it was something from long time ago that's carried forward. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that your your raids need to be totally rebuilt every 10 years. Don't don't try to make them last much longer than that, because you will run into problems. Raids do degrade. Just saying. And back up at least every two years. Yeah, at least. Uh, and, Aaron, Aaron and, points out that actually converting an EXT2 to an EXT3 is pretty trivial. And I, I think that is actually something that was mentioned in the article, too. Yeah, and I have. And I've, I've never converted a 2 to 3, but I've converted converted other file systems yeah. before, and they're they're fairly easy. But yeah. you Just don't well, want you to mess with your data either, necessarily. <laughs> and you can convert all the way to 4. And best time to convert when you actually have to replace that assuming you're talking a single hard drive or single partition mm -hmm. when you have to replace the drive that partition's own right uh that's when that's when i would do it do it at the same time as a hardware upgrade you know aaron uh, also pointed out and i i guess i forgot about this because it's been so long but ext3 is also when they added journaling so mm -hmm. maybe that's Maybe maybe that guy in social media thought that the, the slash boot would be better without journaling for some reason. That but sounds journal vaguely familiar, actually. <laughs> <laughs> journaling is a great feature, and I, you know, we've had it for so long that I, I for, forget I forget the times before we had it. But it was not <laughs> as nice. There was a lot of uh, a lot of discorruption. Uh, yeah, a lot yes. of uh, fixing. <laughs> Well, and maybe somebody who's not computer literate, they're thinking journaling. Every time I boot, I don't want to have to get the pen and paper out in a little <laughs> book and just. Uh, that's that's your hard drive, oh, your, your file system <laughs> keeping notes for you about what changes it's made. And so if if uh, power gets cut in the middle of making a change, it's got the journal. It can go back and look and roll the changes back. And essentially, it's much less likely to lose data in the middle of something going wrong. Unless it's writing to an SD card. SD cards are just sort of evil. <laughs> they're 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 like flash, but they don't have the built in capacitors to save themselves like like good flash does. Uh, yeah, I do not actually like SD cards. I've I've. I've lost customers over SD cards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're they're a different level of storage and there's no. Uh... Like you said, there's no backup. There's no, because a, a normal SSD, they do have capacitors in them. So a power dump, they have a little bit of time in there to kind of put themselves in a good state before they shut off. Yep. 
All right, let's talk Redis. We talked about this last week. The the developers, the group behind Redis has kind of lost their minds and they've gone to a source available license. They are walking away from open source. And as we predicted, there have been multiple forks now of Redis. Well, one of them in particular is from the Linux Foundation Actual. And uh, it is now uh, Valky is a fork from Redis 7.2.4 and will continue going forwards as a BSD three clause licensed project. Uh, and this apparently has backing from Google, AWS, Oracle, and a few others. And uh, this is probably uh, Ericsson and Snap as well. This is probably going to be the sort of anointed fork that everyone is going to jump on. Um, I don't know why they named it Valky. That seems a very interesting name and hard to hard to pronounce from just reading it because I'm not sure if it's Valky. Uh, but yeah, Redis, Redis, Redis is dead. Long live Redis, as they say. <laughs> uh, predictable outcome. It it really was. This is not the first fork and uh, it may or may not be the last. Probably the last well, for a little that, while. That's what's great about open source and that's Always what happens when you uh, mess with the project. Yes. Someone else. Well, yep. if it's a good project. If people are actually people using willing. it. Yes. If you yeah. mess it up badly enough, they'll just go back and fork it. I mean, I've had plenty of my own projects in the past that I messed up and got abandoned. And, and nobody, nobody forked those. <laughs> no, no, nobody even cared. <laughs> uh, Red Hat found that out when they dropped CentOS. Well, people mm -hmm. forked CentOS. Enough people cared about that for sure. Oh, yeah. uh, all right. Yeah. Oh, the dark, the dark times. Let's talk wallpapers. Let's talk wallpapers in Kubuntu. Yeah. Un unfortunately, this story came out a little, little late. So we're you, you have a minimum amount of time here. But if you're an artist and like you get your design out there for the world to see. You know, would you find it fun to have every Kubuntu 24.04 desktop have your background? Well, Kubuntu 24.04 is about a month away, and it comes with this announcement of they're looking for wallpaper submissions to become the official desktop of Kubuntu. And to quote the Kubuntu team, we are in search of unique, inspiring, and beautiful wallpapers that reflect the spirit of Kubuntu and its community. Your design should captivate users with its creativity while also embodying the es essence of Kubuntu's commitment to freedom, elegance, and technical excellence. There are some basic requirements, like the picture needs to be in JPEG or PNG format. It needs to be 38400 by 2160 resolution or better. Uh, it'd be 4K resolution. And you can always go up. So 4K is the minimum. Uh, you don't have much time as it needs to be in by March 31st. But if you win, you will get the honor of contributing to Kubuntu. You will see, receive credit in the release notes and across all of their social media. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, the, the wallpaper contests are always fun. I wonder if they'll have a uh, kind of best of for people to go and look at rather than just sharing the one winner wallpaper. They usually have a mo most of the times they have like a here's the top five or top ten or whatever you know they'll have a list of that that and I want to say that a lot of times they'll have them so you can still use them and if you're like oh I like number three better than the number one and mm -hmm. yeah it seems like it'd be a neat feature to be able to cycle through the top X number of them one a day <laughs> right automatic your, rotating yeah yeah just plugins yep. for that. Uh, all we right. We have the technology. Yeah, we do. We have the technology. <laughs> okay. What about Regatta OS 24? Well, Jonathan Jack Wallen writes why he thinks this old OpenSUSE derivative is the distribution for gaming on Linux. Mm -hmm. Regatta OS lets games gamers access their games from the likes of the Epic Game Store, EA Origin, Ubisoft Connect, Battle.net, GOG Galaxy, Rockstar Launcher, and of course Steam. Although the Steam component has to be installed after the fact, it's not installed part of the initial installation. Regatta OS' main differentiator is game access. 
Game Access is an application that serves as a one-stop shop for setting up all your non-Steam games. It lets you click on one of the launchers, such as Battle.net, to install the required compatibility mode software. Jack feels the simplicity of accessing and playing games on Regatta OS is a breath of fresh air. I recommend reading Jack's article for the just for the history behind Regatta OS 24 and his take on improvements in gaming on Linux over the years. Hmm. I, I wonder how they're I wonder how they're pulling that off. It it sort of reminds me of what Lutris does. Um, Maybe they they do something similar to Lutris to install these uh, these various launchers, um, but and the, Steam could also hit those launchers as well, like Epic and Ubisoft. Yeah, through through Steam. But yeah. I will be honest, being a bit of a gamer, I honestly hate the Ubisoft and the Epic Game Store. <laughs> yeah, they are so kludgy. I mean, yes. it's like why can't you look at Steam and go, hey, let's just kind of <laughs> copy something like that. <laughs> It, oh man they're terrible mm. yes um steam is steam is kind of the ultimate example of okay yes fine it has drm but everything else about it is so good we don't really care anymore <laughs> <laughs> yeah and especially on linux it just works i haven't run a separate uh a, l- a lot of the separate stuff for a long time mm-hmm. steam now just works with proton and I never look back. Yep. Agreed. This Regatta OS actually sounds like it may be a good contender for one of those uh, competitors to Valve's uh, Steam Deck. Yeah, maybe. The thing with I, I could see that. It, I don't know that it will have all of the uh, all of the things um, that make it work on that kind of a, a, a platform, though. Like Steam on Steam OS has some some special magic in there to make it actually work in the handheld factor form factor but for putting it on well, i know desktop, a lot of maybe well i was going to say though a lot of handhelds they're for at least kind of the now this is just uh me cruising the forums and whatnot and other mm-hmm. sites this is not uh, in, any insider knowledge but <laughs> a lot of stuff is uh or a lot of those handhelds are really looking at getting into something like uh steam os or mm-hmm. regatta os or something like that because the windows just bogs the handhelds down too much so they're they're yep. wanting something they can kind of strip down and get more gaming performance and better battery life out of not to mention avoid avoiding having to pay the hundred dollars a pop for the windows license true uh, they probably get a discount if, though i was gonna say if, if you're selling like a whole bunch of those there's probably some well, if you're Corporate if you're magic. if you're Steam and you're going to be shipping millions of them, then yes. But if you're a little guy and you're only going to be doing a few hundred or thousands of them, you know that you can actually. So the the way the way this works with these guys is it's not how many you're going to sell; it's how many you can pay for up front, right? Am, am I? Is this not how this works, Rob? Microsoft doesn't care. Oh, I think I'm going to be able to sell a thousand desktops. Give me a discount. Yeah, I mean that's how most things work. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a uh, OEM, so I, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of the handhelds come from OEMs. Well, they who do. are already making PCs, so they could just bundle that in and go. Well, we're already selling. Yes, so X if number it's, if it is from month. one of those, so if it's from ASUS or if if Dell for whatever reason gets into this market or or one of those players, then yes. They would they would be able to get their their existing discount and pay. I don't know. I don't know how much they pay. Not not the same amount that we pay. That's for sure. Um, but a lot of these little handhelds are coming from, um, you know, kind of new companies or or a Chinese company that does not have something in the U.S. market or a startup doing it. And the Microsoft, the Microsoft tax is a little bit more for those guys. I mean, I've seen I've seen some advertisement on Facebook to get uh, Windows license keys for like 20, 25 bucks. So that might be where they get them from. <laughs> you know, now, there's a hotline. Rob, you know, there's a hotline <laughs> where you can call in and tell Microsoft that a business is ripping Microsoft off like that. And when Microsoft comes in and sues the pants off of them, they'll pay you some of that money back for being a snitch about it. I forgot about that. <laughs> I, I, 
I've heard about I that. Didn't know that e- <laughs> yes. I've I didn't know that it. existed. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, yeah. Those, those that, that is, that is the, gray, those $25 licenses. That is the gray market. Those are licenses that have been used by somebody else and then they're getting resold and they are of questionable legality. I would not touch well, those. We, and you can't install Linux for free. Hotline. <laughs> we need a Linux oh, hotline. For we those are the who Linux are hotline. Ripping off, for those who are ripping <laughs> off Linux, just call us and um, no, we won't do anything. <laughs> we'll, we'll tell you what distribution to use and argue with you about uh, GNOME versus KDE. Yep. Yeah, there you go. Oh, but, but you can, like I said, you can install Windows 10 and 11 for free still. That's true. Microsoft's still allowing it. Yep. It will it will nag you about it, um, but it will continue to work. It just won't get security updates, right? And that isn't that the the the, the it, kicker. It gets security updates. I think after you're it talking about like, up, you're yeah, talking about upgrading. That, yeah. You're talking about upgrading though. You can't no. install on a fresh system without getting that little uh, warning in the bottom to say it's not authentic. Yeah, yeah you can because I've installed one from Microsoft and never registered it and it just has you can't change like the background there's some of the visual stuff you can't change and then there's um in the there's a little water it says yeah a little watermark that says it's unregistered and i i think those eventually but, will stop getting security updates don't they for a while that's what microsoft was doing i don't know if that's still the case as far as i know it still does i haven't booted into it for about a year uh, so i was gonna say jeff is a windows user here so uh <laughs> yeah Oh, <laughs> uh, all right, Rob. Well, if we're going to get away from uh, Windows stories, let's talk about a bash gaming experience. So, yeah, I just uh, came across this uh, fun little game. It's just on GitHub, but all it is is a simple bash script. So it's really easy. Uh, you just download it and run the script. Uh, for those watching, uh, in the background behind me, there is uh, let's see right over there. No, over there. There we go. <laughs> it is uh, one of the games. I'm not the best at word games, but so this game it's called Ladder. And find the show notes. You can find it. it's by Christo Angel, Chris Christos Angel or something. It's on GitHub. And um, Actually, I think the whole name is longer than that, but that's just the Git, GitLab name. Not on GitHub. I keep saying GitHub, but it's on GitLab. But anyway, uh, you, know, you just download this and you can, you know, it's just a, a bash script. So you can do sh space ladder, um, ladder.sh, or you can do a, you can make it executable with a chmod755 ladder.sh. And, uh, then it's a, a nice little uh, word game you can play. And yeah, also, if uh, if you don't really want to play the game itself, it's pretty interesting that this is completely made in Bash and mm-hmm. TUI. So uh, you can use it. You can take a look. And I keep, I don't know if I, I keep thinking a simple little Bash game, but uh, the game's simple. The Bash itself is... Probably it, not. <laughs> yeah, I think it's something like, but it's only it's less than 300 lines so really um so yeah you can take a look at at that and and see how that kind of stuff is done and yeah 293 lines so 293 lines you can make a a, a bash game impressive but uh yeah it's a uh, it's called ladder and it's on gitlab and in the show notes you can find a link to it cool I like it. All right. So we are almost done with my series of tips on resizing that virtual machine's virtual drive. Last time we just finished up with the PV resize and the LV resize. Um, The next thing that we need to do, we're about ready to actually do the file system resize. But before we do that, we need to use LV change space dash A Y and then the device, in this case, it's slash dev slash CentOS slash home. And that is going to activate the volume group again so that we then have that, that file available. And then the next question that if you don't know this, you could really mess your file system up. And that is, what file type is this? Like, what kind of file system is it? Is it an ext2? 
Is it an EXT3, XT4, an XFS? Well, there's an easy way to find out. You can run file and then space dash capital L, which the capital L tells it, go ahead and follow sim links and then lowercase s and then the file name. So file dash capital L lower s slash dev slash CentOS slash home. And in the case of my particular file, it tells me this is an XFS. And so next week, we will actually resize that XFS drive. There is a uh, there is a command specifically for doing that. And uh, we will pretty much finish up this particular series of tips and we'll move on to something else. Uh, up next is Jeff. What do you have for us? So. So this one isn't an exact command, but it's about knowing your commands and how they work. So this example is going to be counting directories. So you have find versus ls. So if you want to count directories with find, you have find space. And then I, in my example in show notes, I have period, which means start right here, space, and then dash type space D, which says only count, only find directories. And then we have a space and a vertical bar, which is a pipe command. And we send that to WC dash L, which is word count and it's counting lines. So it's going, that result is just going to come back with a number of how many directories you have from wherever you search from. Now, if you do and you think, well, maybe I want to count it a different way. I'm going to use the ls command. So you use ls space dash lowercase l capital R. So that's going to list recursively. And then there's a space, a pipe again, space, and then grep space uh, caret d, which is looking for d for directory in the very first position. And then that goes into a pipe command and then WC dash L again. So that's basically saying, okay, list, list everything recursively, pull out just what you see as a directory and get me a count. Well, you're going to come up with two different numbers and you're going to go, wait a minute, what's going on here? Why, why is this happening? Well, this is a place where you have to know your commands. Find will find the hidden directories. Hmm ls using the ls space dash l capital r does not include uh hidden directories so now you might think well i'm just going to add an a in there which in with ls adds hidden directories now we have a third count which will be the highest out of all three of these examples because it also includes the period and the dot dot directories so I just kind of <laughs> wanted to point out, this is a case where you need to know this, the, the subtleties of how this all works and just make sure you understand when you're writing your scripts and using your programs, you, you fully comprehend kind of what's, what's going on. And like in this example, it's three different numbers or three different results, but now you know why. So. Huh. Yeah. Cool stuff. Uh, all right. Uh, Ken is up and, uh, oh, I'm intrigued by this. I, I looked ahead. I see what Ken has. Yeah, this week I came across another tool to check disk usage. Uh, along with DF, DU, and NCDU, this tool can be used to uh, check the disk, your files and your disk usage. Now, since this particular tool is written in Go, it's called GDU. You should find it works faster on SSDs than some of the others. GDU with no options will just show your uh, current directories, disk usage, and subdirectories. For you, those of you listening, make sure there I am. Uh, You'll probably want to try to, at some point, download the uh, video version so you can actually see what just happened when I typed in GDU. <laughs> but uh, 
Now you've got some other options. Uh, while you're in it, you can press the uh, question mark. It'll get, bring you up a little help screen so you can see how to move up and down if you don't just tr automatically just try the arrow keys. Uh, you can rescan your current directory by hitting R. Capital B will toggle your bar alignment to the biggest file or directory. And you can change it to show or hide the file count that uh, Jeff was just talking about. And of course, Q will qu quit at a completely taking you out. It, now, it looks a lot like NCDU. Not exactly, but very similar to it. And I uh, set up one that demonstrates using dash I. Here you can type out the absolute path for a file name and have it ignore it so it doesn't display it in your list. Aha. Uh -huh. I see that being useful. And it is, yep. Especially if you've got a really large directory that you want to take out of the equation. And of course, it's got, you can use dash X so it doesn't cross file systems. That way you can just look and see what is on the local system, for example. Mm -hmm. And not see any subdirectories that have been uh, have a external drive or whatever mounted to them. Yeah, super useful. Yeah, I like it. Um, it looks like it's got a couple of uh, little little flags and differences from NCDU. Uh, also worth noting on Pop OS at least, and I'm assuming on Ubuntu, it is installable via apt, so easy to get. Don't have to go download it manually. Cool. All right, I think that is about it. I will give each of you we we will we will empty the phone lines as some of the uh talk show hosts used to say. We will give each of you the chance to uh get in a last word or a final story. We'll start with Jeff and uh what do you have for us? I got two quick things. One is I found where Enterprise Linux 9 requires version 2 of the microcode and Enterprise Linux 10 they're looking at upping to version three, but it hasn't been uh, mandated yet. So that that basically translates into Intel Haswell error processors or AMD excavators, CPUs, and newer. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what happens there. But right now, everything's still on version two. My, my, poor, and of my poor older server is an AMD Opteron 6272. So it's, it's over 10 years old now. <laughs> yeah, that uh, might... Uh, might cause a little bit of a problem. And the final thing is a crash reduces your expensive computer to a simple stone. Have a great <laughs> week, everybody. <laughs> All right, Rob. Uh, come and connect with me uh, on my website, robertpcampbell.com. That's R-O-B-E-R-T-P-C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L.com. And on there, you can find links to my LinkedIn, Mastodon, and a place to donate a coffee to me. Come connect. There you go. Ken. Well, I just wanted to uh, share a link to uh, Valve's uh, background uh, about behind the making of their trailer for the Steam Deck OLED. I found that very entertaining. All right. And uh, I want to say thank you so much to the guys for being here, helping us out, and to everyone that stuck it out and watched, and uh, both live and those of you on the download. We sure appreciate everyone being here. Uh, the the one thing, I guess two things that I will plug, of course, you've got all my work over at Hackaday. That's the security column, uh, Floss Weekly, which we have a lot of fun with. Um, and then there's also my YouTube channel, which I am starting to put a little bit of content up on. So far, it's meshtastic stuff. I've got got an open WRT project that I think is probably going to show up there before too long. Um, and so that is uh, youtube.com slash, I think, JP Bennett, uh, JP underscore Bennett. Let's see. Uh, JP Bennett. Yeah. At JP Bennett on YouTube and uh, feel free to come check that out and give me a subscribe. I'm still in the process of trying to make it to, I've got the subscribers for it. I'm trying to make it to enough, uh, watch hours over the last 365 years to be able to put 
arbitrary links in videos. <laughs> YouTube is kind of funny about that stuff. Uh, but anyway, give that a check out as well. And hey, we will see everybody next time on the Untitled Linux Show. Hey, you enjoy the show, but really feel like you're missing out? Want to be able to watch our smiling faces as we deliver the news? Want to be able to chat with us in the Discord? Get it ad-free and even more? Hey, it's Club Twit that you're missing, and it's only seven bucks a month. Come on, take a look. Join the club. <laughs>